I have always been fascinated by the topic of dark matter. Dark matter. So in the 18, late 1800s, 1800 and something, there was this guy named Lord Kelvin. He's a physicist, and he's sitting around in his laboratory doing, running calculations, and he's like, whoa, hey, wait a minute here. Or probably something more like, I, great Scott. You know, he's Scottish. Um, he's like doing the calculations, and he, he realizes that... Um, what he stumbled upon is this odd fact that the most basic laws of physics, the first and second laws of thermodynamics, if you plug them into our calculations, something's wrong. Like solar systems should be pulling apart galaxies that we see with our eyes. They should not exist. Unless, he suggests, unless there's some unseen dark matter out there that is causing an enormous, enormous, in a cosmic sense, an enormous pull on everything. Now here's the thing though, that dark matter, you can't see it. And I don't mean like if you shut the lights off and you're walking through the living room, you run into the ottoman. I'm like, it's invisible, like over 130 some years uh, of studying and searching for it, there is no scientific instrument that can detect it. There's no evidence that it actually exists except the fact that the universe as we know would be impossible if it did not. So physicists today estimate that, estimate that dark matter makes up, get this, 85% of the mass of the universe. 85% of everything that is exists in an unseen and unseeable reality. But without it, nothing that we do see could exist. And this is where when you get to the, like the edge of science, it starts to sound more and more like religion. So over the next few weeks, we're going to explore the book of Revelation. And much of it is just going to sound absolutely bizarre. John, the author, is going to tell us that much or maybe even most of reality is unseen and unseeable. But if if it doesn't exist, the world as we know it would not exist. That we're only looking at like this little sliver of reality. That there's a meaning, a purpose, an ethic, a struggle, a longing at work in our world. Without which, without which our world wouldn't make sense. But it's unseen, undetectable. So John, Lord Kelvin, have this in common. They both forced us to see the unseen, but revelation, revelation is not so much like a scientific discovery, it's a lot more. So as a lot of you know, uh, I just spent a very long time, the last three months, on sabbatical, um, personal growth, family time, eating food so good you want to cry. But what you probably don't know, might not know, is that we spent the first two weeks prior to that and before I took my family to Italy, I took my wife to Marble Retreat Center in Colorado, which is an intensive counseling center. To call Marble remote is a vast understatement. It is 45 minutes from the nearest grocery store. It is more than an hour to the nearest Starbucks for the love of humanity. How do people live there? <laughs> There's no cell phone signal, no 4G, no newspapers, no TV. No escape. And so for two weeks, you go there and you meet with these two psychologists, and they spend, the ne they spend 30 hours of counseling focusing on unearthing all the hidden junk in your heart, focusing on uncovering all the stuff you've spent your entire life covering up. To call it revealing or exposing doesn't capture it. It was, in some ways, the worst two weeks of my life and the best two weeks of my life. I saw things in myself that I had never seen before, things that I did not want to know about myself, but I need to know if I hope to grow, if I hope to heal, if I hope to lead, if I hope to be the person that Jesus wants me to be. And that... That revealing, that exposure, that's closer to the book of Revelation. It's not just all the dark matter up there, out there somewhere that holds the universe together. It's all the dark matter in here 
that needs revealed and exposed. The book of Revelation is both cosmic in scale, but intensely personal. It is the best thing you'll ever read and the worst at the same time. So over the next few weeks, we're going to do, like I said, some type of guided tour through the book. Um, It's a tour of the unseen and unseeable realities that shape our world, that shape our hearts, that shape our lives all the time, that are pressing in upon us, that make sense of the ethic, the morals, the the life, the choices we make every single day. And today we're going to do an introduction, just the first five chapters. We're going to skip across the first five chapters time to examine and read every single section. So I would encourage you, if you have your Bibles, please turn there, uh, whether it's a real Bible or a fake one on your phone. Um, you're going to want to follow along with this text here. My hope in this is, is twofold. One, that you do get the message of the book of Revelation, which is by far the most important, that, that you allow Jesus to do this revelatory work in your heart. But I also want to give you a sense of what the book of Revelation is about, give you some tools so that you can go home and read the book on your own and not just depend on me or a commentary, but you can actually meet God in the text. So while you're turning there, um, it's, if you're new to the Bible, e- this is the easiest book in the Bible to find, second only to Genesis. It's all the way at the very end. Just go to the end. Once you get past the, the little section with all the like, maps and stuff, it's right there, all right? Revelation chapter 1. While you're turning there, let me le- um, just lay this out real quick. I know that in the past, for the past at least 100 years, especially in America, um, Christians have set up camps and been very opposed to one another over these issues, over end times issues, over how we interpret these things. So I want to let you know GVF's official position on that, and it is, that's dumb. All right? So, Revelation is famously difficult to interpret. Um, Dividing a church over your view of the iron plated, um, uh, is iron plated lion teeth locust in Revelation chapter 9, that's not going to happen here. That's nonsensical. That doesn't make sense to us. So, all that to say, if you disagree with my interpretations, okay. So you're wrong. No big deal, right? (laughs) Like, you're totally welcome to be here. All right, all right. The other thing I have to say, one caveat on this, is just because a lot of different people have a lot of different views doesn't mean that everything in the book of Revelation is up for grabs. We, as a church, do stand, stand firmly with the historic church, all Christians in all times, up to today, on on at least three things. The bodily, physical return of Jesus Christ. He is coming back. The general resurrection, meaning everyone, everyone will someday be given a, a second life. And then third, final judgment. Everyone will stand before Jesus to be judged. Some to life, some to eternal death. Those are the three things. Everything else up for grabs. We can have a conversation, debates. It'll be fun. Let's do it. All right, with that, book of Revelation chapter 1, starting in verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants the things that must soon take place. So the first thing I want you to see is that it's a revelation. Literally, the word is apocalypse, or apocalypto in Greek. Apocalypse, now the problem, of course, with this, is as soon as we say apocalypse in today's age, you think of this, right? You're like, we're imagining like Brad Pitt running from zombies or, I don't know, what's your favorite? Zombie apocalypse movies and, and uh, horrible plagues breaking out. And there's, there's some of that, to be, great, to be sure. But specifically, when we use this word apocalypto in this context, it means unveiling, exposing, to pull back the curtain. This is a genre of literature, and, and you'll see this in Jewish and early Christian times. So we get bits and pieces of this in Daniel, Ezekiel, Zechariah, just to mention a few in the Bible. And it is not essentially a secret code to understanding the end of the world. It's not. Apocalypse means it's a use of graphic, vivid, sometimes bizarre and grotesque images that are meant to be symbols to give us a glimpse of God's perspective on things. 
It's pulling back the curtain. Like, you see this, but you pull back the curtain, and suddenly you see things through God's eyes. It's how he see, sees things. It's not just historic facts, but it's the why. It's the ultimate aim and meaning of things. So when you look through God's perspective, the hard lines between physical and spiritual, they disappear. Words like past, present, and future become meaningless. Outside of space and time. When you look through God's perspective, some things, some people that look so hideous and poor in this life, suddenly appear glorious. And some people that seem so powerful and attractive in this life seem hideous. It's a great revealing. Now, the idea that someone could possibly know God's perspective and see God's perspective on things, of course, is pretty outrageous, except that this is the apocalypse or the revelation of Jesus Christ. And you got to admit, whether you, you consider yourself a follower of Jesus or not, of all the people who've lived in the history of humanity, if there's one person who might be able to show us God's perspective on things, he's the candidate, right? And can I also say, if you do consider yourself a follower of Jesus, this is the vision, the apocalypse, the revealing of Jesus Christ. This is his teaching through and through. The book of Revelation could all be put in red letter. My point is that it's not some like of useless appendix or optional reading here. This is the teaching of Jesus Christ. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. So this was written by a guy named John, uh, we think, presumably, this is the John who followed Jesus around for three years, who's one of the 12 disciples. Um, some think, because of uh, various reasons, which you can find out in my class, um, some think that this might be another John. Again, it's okay if you want to be wrong. Verse 3, Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and who keep what is written in it for the time is near. So the next thing I want you to notice is that this is a prophecy. Prophecy. This puts this book directly in line with the prophets, with Moses, with Isaiah, with Ezekiel, with Daniel, with Zephaniah, with Zechariah, exactly in line with the prophets of the Old and New Testament. Um, this is not something different than what they wrote. This is the consummation, the end of the prophetic vision. Like if you look at what Daniel was looking at, Isaiah and Ezekiel, and you go to the very end, how it all ends up, all of that is captured in the book of Revelation. So John, his imagination, his view, his description of everything is utterly saturated, soaked, filled to the brim with Old Testament language. Uh, the stats on this are pretty staggering, worth sharing. Out of the 404 verses that make up the book of Revelation, there are 518 allusions to earlier scripture. What makes this so peculiar, though, is that he does not once, not once, directly quote the Old Testament. Now, this is interesting. This is a person who's so soaked it in, so, like, taken in the Bible, that, like, when he speaks, it's just... Biblical language constantly comes out of him. Not that he's quoting it word for word, but it's just part of him. He can't imagine the world outside of what he's heard in the scriptures. So, to make the point, though, when this comes to interpretation, if, when we read about, and we will next week, giant hail, water turning to blood, the sun being darkened, and demon locusts, if we read that, and our very first thought is that these are Apache helicopters, or this is some kind of zombie apocalypse, rather than, ah, oh, this is the language when God saved his people from, in the exodus from, from the Egyptians, from an evil king named Pharaoh. If we think about things today first, rather than from the Old Testament, we might be starting on the wrong track. So the first principle is this is that if we're going to read this, we have to read it in line with the Old Testament. And the last thing I want to point out in these first three verses that opens up this whole book is this. Blessed is the one who reads this aloud. That's me. Blessed are those who hear. That's you. Who hear and who keep what is written in it. 
that Jesus thinks that this is not something that doesn't have implications on your life, that when you hear these words, it should change your life. And if you want to experience blessing as he defines it, and it's going to take the book to figure out what that means, you need to keep these words. Verse 9. Jumping ahead, I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, now let's wait here for just a second. Picture it. Here's the scene. John, at this point, we think he's, he's considerably aged. He's living in a cave on this island of Patmos, which is just off the coast of modern-day Turkey, like Asia Minor back then. He's exiled, so we think that because he was sharing about Jesus all over the world, we think that uh, he was actually sent there and forced to live in exile all by himself. So he's out there in the middle of nowhere. He's worshiping on the Lord's Day, and then suddenly a voice like a loud trumpet says behind him, Write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamum, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to La- La- Laodicea. So John is scared to death, right? This is what my kids call a jump scare. You, know, you go up behind somebody and like, with a loud trumpet, shout this out to him. So he jumps up and he turns around. And what's he see when he sees this? He just heard this voice. He sees these seven golden lampstands. And in the middle of them, there's this odd picture. This picture of it, it says, one like a son of man. Key phrase here. One like a son of man is standing there. And he's described like his hair is white, like white as snow. And he's like, his feet are like burnished bronze. And he's got like this gold sash upon him. And he just looks massive and impressive. And he's got like these, these stars in his hands and this, this two, two-edged sword coming out of his mouth. What? in the world is the question indeed so um right here this is really this is a bit of a rabbit trail that we need to go down what we see is remember john is taking the images of the old testament and 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 he's he's going to show us what they mean and their ultimate meaning here in this book so uh if you're wondering like what is this son of man and why is he standing among all these candelabras and um isn't son of man just the title that jesus used to call himself The answer is yes. Doesn't son of man just mean man? Yes, it does. So what's with this freaky vision? And this this is where we need to pause for a minute and go back to Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7. You don't need to turn there, but I want to, if, if you've never heard the story, let me, re, let me paint the picture for you. It's um, 600 years before Christ. And there's this prophet, this guy named Daniel. He, he's, he's been, he's living in Babylonian exile. So he was, um, He was a prisoner of war, taken by the Babylonians. King Nebuchadnezzar came in, destroyed Jerusalem, stole out all the young, beautiful, strong people, and brought them into into Babylon. And he forced those people to be basically rebooted, reprogrammed to live in Babylon and serve the Babylonian kingdom. So there he is, living in exile. And one night, he goes to bed, and he has this terrible dream. We might call it a nightmare. There are, there's the seed. And out of the sea come these four beasts, one after the other. And each one is more horrible than the one before. Like the first one is like, like uh, what is it? It's like a lion and with, with eagle wings. And there's one with like a bear with all these ribs in its mouth. And then there's this uh, multi-headed, multi-horned leopard that comes out. And then the last beast is indescribably terrible. It's like this mutant thing. And while he's standing there like, what did I just see? One of the people in the vision comes to him and says, what you're seeing is this. The four beasts are four kingdoms. They're four kings to come. And now this, I want you to get this because this is going to give us um, a way of understanding apocalyptic literature, which is what uh, apocalyptic literature, the book of Revelation, this section in Daniel, apocalyptic literature, right? So, so what do we see? This is, a, this is not subtle, friends. This is a commentary that God is making on world history here. We see with our eyes, a historian sees, the Babylonians, the Medo-Persians, the Greeks, and the Roman Empire, respectively. That's what happens. Boom, 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 boom. But through God's vision, we see four hideous beasts, each one more terrible than the one before. 
So this, um, this is putting together God's commentary on what's happening. We see versus what God sees. So, um, do you remember that story about, you know, in the beginning, God, and then he creates lots of things, and then what does he create on the sixth day? Yeah. Humanity. And it was good, and it was good, and it was good. But when he creates humans, it's very good. Yes, yeah, so he has the very good humans, and they're designed to represent him. They're given creativity and the ability to reflect him, to image him in the world, to rule over the beast of the field and the birds of the air and over all creation. They're the pinnacle of creation designed to reflect and, 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 and image God and rule on his behalf. But what happens? When you take the awesome creativity and ingenuity and beauty and strength and authority of a human and you remove God, you become a beast, a hideous mutant beast. What happens when you use your God-given freedom to set up your own kingdom rather than his kingdom? You become a monster. So the very thing that makes humanity so great has the potential to also make us unimaginably evil and terrible. And if you have any questions, just read world history. So, after seeing these four beasts, Daniel then, this, this is key, follow this, he has this dream, he sees these four beasts, they're terrible, 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 and then, well, it looks like the world is careening out of control, these beasts control everything, they're unstoppable, and then suddenly they're like, come see this, and he steps in, and what's he see? The throne room of God. But Daniel, don't, don't you realize, like, no, the world's out of control, Is God like wringing his hands? Is he crying? Like, what am I going to do? No. He's sitting there in absolute sovereign authority. He is not troubled. He is not worried. In fact, the Ancient of Days that you see in that story, what's the first thing he does? He condemns the beast. And then we see he calls in this next guy, this one like a son of man. Now here's the key. We read in Daniel 7, 13, Behold, there was one like a son of man coming on the clouds. Son of man in this context, like you said uh, earlier, it just means man. So here's a human being who's now invited into God's presence, coming on the clouds. And it says in verse 14, I think I have this. Maybe. Maybe. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom and all the peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion and everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. And his kingdom was one that shall not be destroyed. So finally there is a human who seems to be able to do what no other human in history has been able to do. A human who can stand up to the beast. A human who reflects the image of God, a human who rules as his representative. Now, this is 600 B.C., and no one has any idea what Daniel's talking about at the time. But 600 years later is a guy who shows up and says, um, he doesn't call himself the Christ. No, other people call him that. He doesn't call himself Lord or God or Savior. He calls himself, I'm the Son of Man. That's who I am. I'm what humanity is supposed to be. This man named Jesus shows up, and he's the one human who can do, according to his own claims, who can do what no other human in history could do. He can conquer the beast. He can reflect the image of God. He can rule over creation in a way that is not against God's kingdom, but is part of God's kingdom. He can lead everything back to God. So, 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 when John sees one like a son of man, he knows, and we're supposed to know, that this is none other than Jesus God's king, the Messiah, the one who can defeat the beast, the one who can bring creation back into the way it's supposed to be. He's the way humanity is supposed to be in relationship with God. Now, as for the beast and stuff, we'll see that next week. Verse 17, when I saw him, John, back in Revelation chapter 1, John says, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, fear not, I'm the first and the last, the living one. I died, 
and behold, I am alive forevermore and have the keys to death and Hades. He's like, John, John, it's me. Now write this down. And then he gives us in the next two chapters what is known as the seven letters to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea, or Laodicea. Um, now, now let me say, in the history of interpretation, some people have viewed this differently. Jesus says, John, I want you to write out these seven letters to these seven churches. And here's, this is Asia Minor here. Um, Greece is over there. Modern-day Turkey right here. Patmos down there where John is. Um, some think that these seven churches have a mystical meaning, that each letter represents a different era in church history. It's possible. But there is a simpler explanation here. Um, in the ancient Roman world, there was a major road that went from Ephesus to Smyrna to Pergamum, Thyatira to Sardis to Philadelphia to Laodicea and back to Ephesus. It was a circular road. So if you had this letter that was supposed to be read in each of those churches, that's just where you'd end up on the next stop of the road. So it's a little bit like saying, write this letter to Bryn Mawr, to Wayne, to Berwyn, Paoli, Malvern, Frazier, and you'd be like, an extant, an extant. What is the deep spiritual meaning of that? You're headed down 30? Yeah, you're headed down 30. So that's probably what it means. And this brings us to our next really, really big observation about how we're going to approach this text in general. Um, This book was written to seven particular churches and particular locations at a particular time with particular struggles. All right? This is written, this, this whole book of Revelation is written for seven specific churches at a specific time with pre- specific struggles. Or to say it a bit stronger, the book of Revelation is not a secret code written so that a few people who happen to have the decoder ring can know when Jesus is coming back and what the mark of the beast is. It's not. It's written to these seven churches to help them see their struggles, their world, their lives from God's perspective. Now, am I saying that the book of Revelation therefore does not apply to us? Of course not. It's like every letter in the New Testament. The Apostle Paul wrote Romans to Romans. Yeah, Colossians to Colossians, Ephesians, right? So each of these is written to a specific group, but it's included in the Word of God because its meaning has timeless truth for us. What I am saying, so, so to quote Dr. John Walton, who visited here once, it was written for us, but it was not written to us. And until we appreciate that difference, it, it was written for us, for the church of all times, but it wasn't written to us. Until we appreciate that distinction, we might make some big mistakes. If we don't take the original audience and the historical setting seriously, we are going to have some serious problems. We're going to have to like read the newspaper and, and all kinds of guesses about what the next thing is. But if you recognize that the Roman Empire at that time controlled the entire world, the emperors increasingly demanded not only allegiance but worship, And that the early Christians faced a very real choice. Will I worship Caesar or will I worship Christ? Decisions that that would, would make a difference in whether they could buy or sell. That would make a difference in whether they would live or die. Until we understand that, we can't really understand this book. So at the most basic level, we need to appreciate that this book was written sometime. Sometime between the reign of Nero, Emperor Nero... Uh, 54 A.D. and uh, Domitian down to 96 A.D. Most of the evidence will suggest a later date around 90 A.D. We can talk about that later. Next week we will. But this whole era, whatever time period you put this book in, this whole era is marked by a rapid ex- escalation in emperor worship. Domitian, he, emperor, he, um, he demanded to be called our Lord and our God. Our Lord and our God. Does anyone else claim that title? Do you think that's going to be a problem for the early Christians? Yes, yes it is. So now these seven churches are set in this atmosphere where they have to choose. Am I going to follow Rome and be part of this world? Or am I not? Am I going to face suffering and death for it? And so they each have their own set of struggles. I won't go through all of them, but let's just list out a few. Apathy, 
affluence, immorality, heresy, persecution, just to name a few. So in Ephesus, the big problem is what? Jesus says, you've forgotten your first love, that you've gone cold on me. You forgot what this whole thing's about. Smyrna, they are poor and just getting the junk beat out of them. They're super persecuted. Pergamum, they're facing persecution. Some guy even died, even died for his faith, and yet, and yet, Jesus holds this against them. They're allowing false doctrine to circulate in the church. Thyatira, the problem, one word, sex. Yeah. Do you think that has any application for today? And Jesus says in chapter 2, verse 23, listen to these words to Thyatira. That he's going to judge them, and then all the churches will know that I am he who searches mind and heart. And I will give to each of you according to your works. Jesus says, I know what's going on in your mind and heart. You can't hide it. There is no such thing as secret sin, Thyatira. There is no such thing as secret sin, GVF. Sardis, Jesus says, you have a reputation of being alive. Like everyone looks at you and thinks, they're awesome. That church is great. But Jesus says, but you are dead. Philadelphia is powerless and persecuted in Laodicea. Oh, he says, for you say, you say, you think, I'm rich, I'm pro- pro- I have prospered, I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. To which all God's people say, ouch. Self-deceit rules there. So these churches are a real mixture of wealthy and poor, apathetic, suffering for Jesus, all of these things. But Jesus' message to the seven churches is this. Tribulation is coming. Persecution and pressure, unlike anything you've known, it's coming. It's coming. And each and every one of you is going to have to make this choice. Will you suffer? Will you suffer? Will you stay in love with me? Will you choose me? And become an overcomer? Or will you choose the emperor? Will you choose your wealth? Will you choose your family? Will you choose your safety in your life? Every single person is going to have to choose. The choice is coming. And this will set up the plot for the rest of the book of Revelation. The rest of the book, Jesus is just pulling back the veil and allowing them and us to see what's really happening, what's really at stake. That these little choices about sex and about their money and about their jobs and about where they, who they hang out with, that they're really having these massive cosmic effects that are going to have eternal effects. Now, while it's true that Jesus is speaking to these specific churches, um, tell me, is it still true that we have to make a choice? Is it still true that we're tempted to serve a system of greed and lust and dehumanization? Is it still true that it's going to cost you a lot if you want to live out kingdom values and say that Jesus is your Lord? So the rest of this book is an unveiling of reality that is every bit as real as this pulpit and the person sitting next to you, but you can't see it. Not yet. Not yet. So after these letters, we come to this section, chapter 4. After this, John says, I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven. Remember, after Daniel saw the four beasts come up out of the sea and this terrible, the world's being destroyed, what does he see next? He sees the same thing John sees. He says, and the first voice which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. And at once I was in the spirit and behold, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne, and one who sat on the, had the appearance of jasper and carnelian, and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald, and around the throne were 24 other thrones. Seated on the thrones were 24 elders, clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. So, so John is ushered into the very throne room of God. He's picturing now, this, you're seeing heaven itself, and he can't even, words fail 
he just pulls out all these images from the Old Testament about how the temple was made and when God showed up at Sinai and he says it's something like that and it's something like that and it's something like that and he says and there are these 24 elders seated around the throne and they're wearing white and they have gold crowns and you're like huh who are these guys and it's really there's some debate we're not quite sure but the thing that's interesting about each of these guys is that they're wearing all white robes and a golden crown. This is the exact same outfit that the high priest of Israel would wear one day a year. The Day of Atonement. The one day per year where he was allowed to come in and by the blood of a perfect sacrifice enter into the very holy of holies, the very presence of God, and offer for the people a sacrifice of atonement for the people. That he was actually allowed into the presence of God. All four of these 24 priests have that outfit on. The other thing that's interesting is the number 24. In, in 1 Chronicles 24, we read that David divided up the priest into 24 courses of priests. So whatever this is, whatever this image is, there's somehow connection between what's happening on earth in human worship down here and what's happening in heaven. That somehow heaven and earth are reflecting one another in this moment in worship. And from the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. Before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like crystal. And it keeps going. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. And these four living creatures, they look like a, a lion, an ox, a man, an eagle, and each has six wings and eyes on the front and back and everywhere, which leads us to our next principle of interpretation when we come to the book of Revelation. Don't try to draw it. Don't try to draw it. So, so these things, when you talk about living creatures that look like a, a lion with a, all these wings and eyeballs everywhere, it, you'll come up with something preposterous or ridiculous. That is not how apocalyptic images work. They're not meant to be drawn or visualized. They're meant to be understood. They're meant to be seen with the heart, not with the eyes. The whole point is that this is something you can't imagine visualizing. The point is that each one of these aspects of these living creatures and so many of the symbols in the book of Revelation is that it's showing us a spiritual reality, things that cannot be captured. So, it's not part of our human experience. Now get this. Get what we just saw here. When Jesus shows up to John, says, write these books, or write these letters, and then come see this. When he peels back reality and says, I want you to see what's really going on in your lives, in your world, what's going on from God's perspective right now, he sees the exact same thing that Daniel sees. God is seated on the throne. Right now. But I thought you said that the Roman Empire was like ruling over the whole known world and doing terrible things. It is. And I thought you said that there's heresy and immorality and sex and secret sins rampant in the church. It's true. I thought you said that it's dehumanizing. There's whole systems of the world. The economy and the relationships and families and nations are all breaking down and killing each other and hating each other and random acts of violence. And it's terrible. It's true. And God is on his throne. I thought you said, but we have marriages blowing up in our church. But most of the world doesn't know or care about Jesus Christ. But people might walk into this very room and start blowing us away because that's how sick our world's become. The nations are warring. The things feel completely out of control. The people all have to be drugged up because we can't deal with our present reality. It's true. And God is on his throne. And the elders and living creatures, they respond in the only proper way when you're faced with the reality of who God is. They worship.
And then I saw on the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll, and with it was uh, within it on the back sealed with seven seals. And he sees this this um, this image of uh, the man, the, the God sitting there on the throne has this the scroll sealed seven times. And John sees it and it's like he understands, and we understand immediately what that is. That is the scroll on which God says, I control all of history. I know how everything's going to end up. I know how everything's going to be put back together. I know how everything's going to be fixed. I hold it all in my hand. And John sees it, and he sees that it's sealed and immediately realizes what we should realize. No one, no one, no one deserves to read that. No one deserves to have part of that. And he starts weeping. And then one of the elders says to him, Weep no more. For the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, the great Messiah, he's worthy. Your life, our world, he's worthy to hold that. He's worthy to unfurl that. And John hears this great image, the Son of Man, the Lion of the tribe of David, uh, the the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, this great Messiah, this great King. And when he turns and looks, he sees this lamb as though he's been slain. And all the living creatures and the elders, they stop and they worship. And this, this is the great paradox that will shape Revelation in our lives. That Jesus is simultaneously the great king, the all-sovereign God, and a lamb who's been slain. That the way he has his great victory is by dying for us. And the way we'll have victory is by dying with him. So one question, one suggestion, and then we'll finish up. Next week we'll We'll get into all the um, untold horrors of apocalypse. We'll find out when Jesus is coming back and stuff like that. Uh, one, one question. What would Jesus write to us if he wrote us a letter? Let's personalize this. What would he write to you? Isn't it interesting that Jesus, who... Lord of the universe, overseeing all things, is preoccupied with what's going on very, very specifically in each one of these churches. He cares deeply. This is your cosmic marble retreat center moment. And you know, the thing about marble retreat is that you, you leave there, I can speak from experience, caring a lot less about all the things you thought were important. And caring a lot more about the things that you realize are important. What would Jesus write to you? And then the suggestion, really the choice is this, is that throughout the book of Revelation we're going to see everyone worships, everyone worships, everyone worships. That's just a choice you make though. Do you think that ultimate reality is going to be shaped by the beast? by your job, by what other people think of you, by your title? Or do you recognize that it's shaped in the hands of the lamb who's been slain? If you would close your eyes, and I just want to finish with these words as uh, the band comes out to close us out. Then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor, and glory, and might forever and ever, and the four living creatures, and the elders, and GVF said, Amen.